Here we go, guys. I am finally able to provide you with a copy, let you watch the fight against Lordzilla. This happened back in 2012, and it was the first big event that K1 had had in the States in a long, long time. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of backstory on the, how the whole thing transpired. We're going to go through the fight together. I'm going to break down everything. This will be a great follow-up to the video I just put out, which was how I defeated Lordzilla. And look at this guy. He had just been on a tear for such a long time. He was fighting guys through the States. He was actually living in the States at the time, and he was actually just annihilating all the competition. And as you'll see in my video that I just referenced, I believe he was rolling through people because everybody fought this dude wrong. They were just trying to be a Muay Thai fighter with a Muay Thai artist, a Muay Thai specialist. This guy is different. He's unique. What you need to do against this guy is take him outside his normal comfort zone. Don't let him initiate the fight the way he wants to. And I was able to do that in this fight. Now let's talk quickly about how I was able to get the fight because that was a really, really difficult thing for me. You know, I'd been on the professional stage. Uh, I started in 2009, so I'd been on for three years, three years fighting pro, but I was finding it very difficult to get any fights for the big organizations obviously because I was North American and there just wasn't a lot of respect for North American fighters then not to the same extent that there is now so to get this fight I had to really really hound K1 I was on them just every month sometimes even every couple weeks just emails just letting them know you know I'm here I'm ready to fight and when this opportunity arose when I knew this event was happening in LA which is just you know straight down from where I am in Victoria BC I actually offered to fly myself, my team down, to fight for free, just so I could have this. They, they didn't take me up on that. They said, no, no, you're a pro fighter, we'll pay you, which was very nice, but I was ready to step in and fight anybody and have no financial compensation from it. That's how motivated I was to fight. So when they said Lurdzilla, I looked him up, I went, whoa, this guy's good, but I can beat him and I'm willing to fight anybody, so let's do it. And before the fight gets underway, I'm going to tell you guys a little funny story about the backstage situation. I had become very, very used to being the guy who fought last on fight cards. You know, I would be the main event. And because of that, I would very often show up at the venue. People would, would you know, bus us in or drive us in at 3, 4 in the afternoon, and I wouldn't fight till 11 p.m. So because of that, I had gotten very used to laying down and trying to relax, trying to take a break and just let my body just you know, cool down and my mind just sort of goes zen. And I would do that quite often by listening to Jack Johnson. So I remember as I was walking out on the catwalk there, just being way too calm, even though I'd done my warm up, just feeling so mellow. And just when we touch gloves, I'm like, ugh, I just, I don't know if I'm really in this position where I'm mentally focused for this fight, just too calm. So after that, I stopped listening to Jack Johnson before the fights. All right, guys, here we go. Glove touch, respect. And right away, we both come out fairly aggressively. One of the things I knew about Lordzilla is you're going to have to bring the pressure to him. That was a big key. If you let him control and dictate the pace of the fight from the early stages, it's just going to be so difficult to take over. So right away, I knew I had to pressure. I got a little, little, little pull down there. But overall, right from the get-go, push the pace. And you can see he's very, very kick oriented that's what he's going to throw a lot of probably more than 50 percent of his techniques are kicks but if you don't drop your hands and you don't leave your head open he's not going to land anything substantial on you and we knew that we also knew like you saw right there if he throws a kick you got to counter back right away and his taunting his, his you know cheekiness in the ring you don't let that bother you because you know what's coming and you just go you know you waggle your head and i hit you and i think that's a fair exchange i'll take that exchange that little shot there, that little nice left hook. I remember that one. Ooh. And then right there, there's the knockdown. And they didn't call it a knockdown. Big mistake. That was 100% a knockdown. You can see it in the replays. But right away I came out and I went, oh, maybe he's still stunned. Let's put the, pre the, the pressure on him. And he just, credit to him, recovered so well off that. I mean, it looks like he was out for a second when he fell. And then on his way back up, he was already focused. And he's already evading shots again. 
So again, just keep the pressure. That was that was a bit of a, a slap in the face not scoring that knockdown because that would have basically given me the round 10-8 and now I still have to fight, I still have to pressure to win this round. You notice there how I went from the, the head to the body, that's a key to beating this guy. When he kicks like, right, like I did there, I kick back, keeping the pressure on him. The lack of clench work in K1 I find a little frustrating, but I didn't really prepare for it. I didn't put any time into preparing for it because I knew I wouldn't get away with it. But I love clinch work. I really do. I'm actually very good at it, but I don't get to demonstrate in K1 or Glory or Bellator how that is one of my strengths. And it's disappointing for me. I wish they'd go back to old school K1 rules. Just keeping the pressure on him, not letting him run away, keeping those ring ropes and using them to my advantage. He fights very well off the ring ropes because he leans back. But just like you saw there, he leans back. You throw a follow-up shot. You can only slip so many shots. As long as you keep the pressure on and you don't let him circle away. They're just firing, firing, scoring. And he's good at tying people up too. He was very good at that. And there's the first round. Like I said, it should have been a 10-8. We're going to go back in a moment. We're going to see the slow motion replay to just confirm that that was definitely a knockdown. Flash knockdown, yes, but definitely a knockdown. And here we go. You see the low kick come, the check, and right in, and it looks like it kind of caught him right on the ear. The, the, the speed at which he got up is wild, because if you see here, a little bit from the front, he just went out there. His body was limp. And the recovery time, fantastic on his part. That's the first time that I've ever seen him be knocked down like in a long, long time. I can't. I remember researching and going, man, I can't find anything of this guy getting knocked down. So the, the plan was not to try and force a knockdown. It was just try and touch him. Just keep touching him. Don't worry about scoring a knockdown because he's just too evasive. But to be able to be one of the first guys in a long, long time to get that knockdown, I think it changed around the aspect of the fight in his mind. And I'd seen this a number of times where he climbs. If it was Muay Thai, the elbows would be a danger because he might be able to drop them. Assuming you can do north-south elbows, but in this fight, it wasn't a concern. I can just hold him up there. And it was nice to see some hands from him there. They're not the best hands, but he's fast. And one of the mistakes I made after landing the spinning back fist was trying to continue to land it. And maybe it threw him off, kept him on his toes, but I didn't land anything massively effective spinning-wise after that. So it's just kind of a, a one-hit wonder for me in this fight. Those front kicks, he's very, very good at, but you can see I just take a little step back. Just a little step to keep my balance. And it kind of took that offense away from him. Just trying to stay in his face. He was very good at wrapping the hand around the back of the neck, making it difficult for me to punch. And you work the body first, then you come to the head. Look at that evasion from him. And then once he throws, he's so good at stepping forward, closing the distance. You're not allowed. And they give him multiple warnings. Probably in the end could have taken a point off him by the end of the fight, but nice little Superman there. That's the key with these TIE Fighters. I know I've talked about it in my YouTube videos, way, certain ways to beat TIE Fighters, and one of them is being unorthodox. You don't want to fight the fight that your opponent wants. Catching him to the body. Like I said, he's very good at wrapping up the back of the head. It makes it very difficult, especially when he's the smaller fighter, to drag me down and make the punches difficult. His movement, ability to move off the ring ropes is very good, but I was actually very happy with my ability to keep him against the ring ropes quite often. Because he kind of settles there. But see, his legs get stationary, and then you can land those low kicks. And that's a big, big asset. The low kicks that I was able to land in the fight. Just right there. Take the kick, and you give him one back down low. There's this pressure here. Keep tagging him. Stay on top of him. Body. And for the head, even if I miss, I land. I land it on the body. So the second one is, is not there, doesn't hit anything, doesn't matter, because my first one landed. 
I love that technique there because he's so good at keeping people off, off them with his extended front kick. Keeping that pressure here. Just trying to stay scrappy. Switch knee is probably a difficult thing to land against this guy, but you know, why not? Give it a try. I was like trying to put on a bit of a show. And they're going to go back and show us a replay of his long front kick, the way he uses it defensively and what I did to stay out of range, but still stay in that distance where I could land the punch. I really like this technique. And I knew as soon as he started throwing it, that it was going to be something that I could take advantage of because he's on one foot. It's hard to move your head when you're on one foot. He's already stretched back, comes up, boom. All right, and it's not a massive shot, but it's landing. And his front kicks are very inconsequential. Little push, touches down. And, it th and then because I did a little fake down low there, it threw him off and he wasn't able to lean back early enough. But his back mobility is wild. How good he is at taking a shot and just rolling back with it. It is very impressive. And I can see why this guy very, very rarely gets knocked down. All right, the last round. At this point, I already knew that I had the first and the second. I don't think there was any question about that. But I still wanted to put the fight pace on him. Because I'd been on the end of a bad decision before. A very terrible questionable decision. It wasn't too too much before this. So I was very aware that I did not want to leave this in the hands of the judges. Especially knowing how popular this guy was. So I'm trying to stay on him. And he's bringing the pace up. He's picked it up. He knows. Nice little touch there. Not trying to power the head kicks. Just touching. I love that one there. Body and then down to the leg. It's what you have to do against this guy. Keep the pressure on the body and the legs. It's hard to be evasive with those. And that was a nice head kick there. That was a really nice one. And I love this sweep. That's one of the most proud moments of this fight for me, actually, just putting the Thai guy on his, on his stomach. Little inside low sweep and then forcing him over. When was the last time somebody threw down Lordzilla? And again, those front kicks come. I just take that little step back. He lands a low kick. Nice little turn there. Like I said, I am actually very proficient in the clinch. Um, one of my favorite moves in the past was to sweep somebody with the bottom of my foot against their shin. I like that one there. I caught it. I knew if I threw the punch off the catch, he would lean back. So just attack the leg. He's on one foot already. He can't move that leg. Just fighting smart. Nice little Dutch block there. He throws the kick. Doesn't matter. It doesn't score under K1 rules. And this guy honestly doesn't hit hard enough to break down my forearms. There's no way. So you just keep your head protected. That was the main goal in this one. Just don't let him, you know, throw a Brazilian kick or a little head flick up, catch you in the jaw. doesn't matter how good your evasion is, you have to still land shots. So his evasion is amazing. He's so hard to land shots against. But if you're not landing, you're not winning the fight. So even if he slips half of my shots, he moves off to the side like that, you didn't land anything. And that's the most important part of the fight, is making sure that you are doing more damage. That's all what the fight is about, it's all damage. And just keeping that pressure right to the end. Again, even though I've already won this round, I'm touching him the whole time. I know that this fight is mine. But it's still nice. It's still very nice to keep that pace up. Make sure the fans are enjoying it. My, car my corner was constantly yelling at me to push forward. Just don't give this guy any time. You know, just punch, punch, punch like that. Long combos. Keep the pressure on. And that was a fantastic feeling there. You know, I just had trained so hard for this fight. Waited so long for an opportunity like this. And this fight was the one that really sort of threw me up the podium. I uh, got the attention of Glory. I was able to get into Glory after this. And just from there, propelled my career forward. And yeah, to beat, to beat somebody like that is amazing. And to be honest, one of the big fights that I've wanted after this was against Sanchai. Sanchai is very similar to Lerdzilla, maybe not as great evasively, but 
definitely more proficient as an offensive fighter while still being amazing at his defense. Very hard to land against. I've been trying to get that fight for a long time. It's just never presented itself, but I've been asking for it. So we'll see if we can ever make that happen. And here's my crew. I got Craig McWilliam right there. He's been my pad holder since I think 2007. Um, just working with me on that really fast paced pad work, just pushing and pushing. So my cardio is top notch and it's very freestyle pad work, which, which makes it very close to sparring, much, much closer to sparring than any other pad work I've seen people do. And then you see crew Alin, who's in my corner. I don't get to train with him very often, but he is a very, very good coach, Muay Thai coach from out in Ontario. And he has followed me around the world. And then, of course, you only saw him there for a second, but I've had my brother with me right since the, the very beginning. He started uh, being my main cornerman when I started fighting for amateur world titles. And I think he's only had to miss two of my fights throughout my whole career, which is amazing. I mean, you can't be at, every, at all of them just because he does have school and he's a busy guy, especially now that he's in med school. But pushing... To, to have that amazing team there made a big difference. And I had even more guys back home who just helped me so much for this fight. 